Today, I want to talk to you about a promise. And uh, I try to be very careful about the promises that I make because I know how difficult they can be to keep and maintain. And literally, some of the promises that are made are beyond our ability to be truthful to and complete. This is why I believe he is such a wonderful God. He can make things, all things, all things right. Now, for many of us, the most important promise that we can make are the promises and vows of marriage. We often do this with witnesses attending, and we promise to love and cherish and honor and protect each other to death to do us part. Amen. Naturally, we call this institution marriage. <laughs> now, some might wonder who could create such a device or such an institution that could be so strenuous to be faithful to? <laughs> who could be so faithful? Well, Ephesians 1 4 says, He chose us in Him before creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight and love. Think about that. From the creation. Now I've read about Jesus and his coming, his movements, his leaving, and his promise to come again. And I believe it. And I wait for the promise because that is what I was taught to do. Why? Because I believe in the spirit. Why? Because I have felt it. That is my testimony. Even without fully understanding it, luckily for me, Jesus spoke in parables, not to confuse us, but to express truth in ways that we could literally grasp, to make it tangible and something that we could fully understand right down to the innermost reaches of our soul. Only recently did I begin to grasp other things, not just that he came to sacrifice himself for us, but how it was given to us right from the beginning. I began to understand that when Jesus spoke to his disciples and said certain words, these words were in accordance with traditions that had been accepted all their lives. They didn't question it. They got the meaning immediately. Well, I'm not Galilean. For example, if I say certain words to friends outside the circle, others might take the wrong meaning. But those inside the circle will instantly understand what I'm referring to and what I'm saying. The use of these right. terms heard by someone outside the circle could be totally contradictory to the meaning, but clear to those involved. But as we study the records that are available to us, and realize the long-standing traditions of the Galilean wedding and how they align themselves with the coming and going and the promise of Christ, it overwhelms me. I can't do anything but rejoice. It's just so perfect. I was taught that the world was longing, needing, and desperate for meaning of life itself. And while we were searching, continually it was beyond us. The world was losing hope, losing direction, losing to the ability to perceive anything beyond our own perceptions and existence. That is, the bride had lost her way as she was. She was not desirable. But there was one who designed her and this one petitioned his father for her hand. He set forth a process to redeem her. So you can imagine this process being longstanding, even before the arrival of Jesus. The father negotiated the price and established the terms and faithfully negotiated the transaction. 
think about this. Think about where I'm going. Don't get lost. Now, the key players in a Galilean wedding would be the bridegroom, that being our Savior, Jesus Christ. The bride herself being the church, hopefully meaning us, and I'll expound on that later. And the Father, who presided over everything. Obviously, that's our God, our Father God himself. The process of the Galilean way would take oh, about a year, which was representative in Jesus leaving and his promise to return. The bridegroom would leave his father and go to the house of the prospective bride as Jesus came down to us. And as I inferred earlier, the father would officiate the betrothal, set the terms and the price to be paid for the bride, which was a precious price for us to be sure, our Savior Jesus Christ. This was not done in secret. The Galilean wedding was one of the most important events throughout the community. All were invited, all were accepted by our Father and our Savior. The bride herself would accept the terms and the gifts that would be exchanged. And of course, these most extravagant of those would be given to the bride. And the dowry was given to ensure the bride would be taken care of in case something happened. Something we didn't have to worry about because we know our Lord God is faithful. We know he's faithful. John 13, John 3, 16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is far reaching. This goes back a long way. Now at the wedding, something significantly would happen. Something that we can all identify associated with the Galilean wedding. The bridegroom would take a container of wine and pour it in a special ceremonial cup called the cup of joy. Offer it to the bride, and this symbolized the bride's acceptance of the betrothal. Now this was a binding covenant promise agreement, binding by the laws of the present day. This acceptance for us represents our desire to be with Christ. But now the groom would do something equally profound. He would announce to everyone that he would not drink of the vine, fruit of the vine, until he came together again with his wife in his father's house. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Now, this is Galilee wedding that I'm telling you about. Luke says, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This is what he said to the disciples. These are the things that the Galileans practiced long before Christ came. Where did this tradition come from? As if we didn't know. Now, after this has all been done, there's still work to do. The groom goes away and prepares a place for his new bride amongst his father's house. Does that sound familiar? Of course it does. <laughs> In John 14, my father's house has many rooms or mansions. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, you will come, I will come back and take you with me, that you will also be there where I am. We're out of here. <laughs> okay when he comes back we're done with this place we're out of here I don't know what you think you've gathered I don't know what you, you, you've hoarded I don't know what you think is important be ready to leave it all behind 
Now, the bride and those that had attended her, her bridesmaids, will spend a long year preparing to be, be received. And there will be rules that she must remain faithful. Philippians says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the groom also, again, made these promises in front of witnesses. So he himself must be faithful, which again, this is our savior. He's already proven that. <clears throat> now, we're probably all wondering, okay, fine. He's been gone a year or whatever that time is. When is he coming back? No one knows but the father. But I can only imagine being a bride or a groom myself, okay? The anticipation. You know you're getting married, but the time between you say you're going to get married and I do, the anticipation is... Ah, can he scrap? Can you imagine our Savior having those desires for us? Can you imagine him going to his father? Dad, is it time yet? <laughs> no, not yet. Can you imagine him repeating that question time and time again? And he says, not yet. Until one day he says, go get your bride. Matthew says, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. I was inspired by this. Revelation says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready with fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. The linen stands for the righteousness acts of the holy people of God. <clears throat> the angel of God said to John, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words of God. Now, <laughs> well, I don't want to skip forward. So I started out talking about a promise, which is a promise of redemption and salvation that will last forever. But the question occurs to me, when did this all begin? When did someone recognize a need for redemption? Romans 5. Consequently, just one trespass resulted in condemnation for all the people. So also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all the people. Suggest to me that this plan for our salvation was put into motion right on the heels of the first sin. He knew what we needed and he made a way. If I were to use Jesus' example, of using parables and comparisons, it would occur to me that this long-standing tradition of arranged marriages is not strange to us. We have seen this down through our own history where marriages have been arranged by people who haven't even been born yet. They've never met. I've been present at many, many Weddings and they always inspire happiness to me and always inspire new beginnings. The expectations are endless. However, I can only imagine the sadness felt by our Heavenly Father when He reviews our sins, countless as they may be, and yet He found a way to love us, to show us His love. 
He found a way to relate what was true to us in ways that we could grasp it. I can only imagine the complexity in the workings of such a loving God, a magnificent God. Now, <laughs> when I'm talking to the believers, this is totally palatable, totally digestible. But for some, it might seem to be just a little fairy tale. Sounds really good. I tell you that if you let the Holy Spirit in, you will see the truth in this. You will want to get on board and be prepared to be received by our Savior, to be his bride. We are his church, and he desires us with unimaginable zealousness. Matthew said, at the time the kingdom of heaven will be ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long time coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. They said, no. They are not there's not enough for both of us. Instead, go and buy oil for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. The virgins who were ready went with him and the wedding and to the wedding banquet, and the doors were shut. Later, the others who came, the Lord said unto the door, said, open the door for us. He replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. I'd stop there, that's sad. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. We must be vigilant. We must stay ready. We must keep the promise. We must walk in the light. We must be righteous. And we must ask for forgiveness when we're not. We must make ourselves ready. We must help others make themselves ready. This is what he asks us to do. This is what we feed as sheep. I have been a husband and a father and it's been a joyful experience for me. However, it wasn't easy. But being on the other end, being on the receiving end, being the child, I can't imagine anything more wonderful than when he comes back to get me. I can imagine it. Because of all the things that have gone on in my life, I can imagine it because I can put myself in those traditions and imagine those traditions handed down to the Galileans and we know where they came from. I invite you believers to hold steady, be ready, be prepared for that wonderful day. The day is coming. It is coming because our Lord and our God is faithful. Of all the parables that I have read, <laughs> I can't imagine one more profound, more to the question of why I am and what I should do.
I've only given you a few words regarding this Galilean wedding. I have given you a few scriptures regarding how Jesus applied himself to that tradition. But I hope I've inspired you to do more studying. Now, I guarantee you, one of my mentors, she is going to make this a Bible study. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. So I encourage you to keep tuning in. I encourage you to ask questions. I encourage you to seek because he promises you shall find. I encourage you to ask the questions because if you believe the answer will be forthcoming. This is promise, not mine. Okay. And I hope I, I, I've, I've inspired you to do just that, to jump in here and just feel the spirit. I Can you feel that? <laughs> Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for that which we could not even imagine when you conceived of it. We can't imagine the complexities of you having a complete perfect plan for us but we ask you to guide us so we can stay in the light, stay within your plan, and be prepared for the coming of your son. This is what we desire above all else. And for those who don't understand, please help us to reach out to them so they can feel that spirit and know the truth. Not because I say it because it's part of them, like it's part of me. We ask you this, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. Let everyone say amen. 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 Uh, thank you so much for that sermon, Doug. Um, while we prepare, prepare for communion, I do wish to open up the doors of the church. Like Doug mentioned in the sermon, you know, um, the way to eternity is spend time with Jesus Christ is through the acceptance of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Like Doug said, our path has been prepared from the very beginning, from the fall of, of, of Adam. This vessel was put into place and this vessel is for everybody. It's not just for the Israelites, it's not just for the Jews, it's not just for the Americans or the Europeans. Jesus avails himself to all. It's only He's only waiting for us to accept his hand in marriage to him to receive our gift. So if you Believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We ask you to find a local church to receive either baptism or the right hand of fellowship. And we also offer that to you here with the um, Spirit of the Light Virtual Church. Please reach out to us. If there's no one lo locally, we will make arrangements to do that for you. So with that, I will turn you over to Sister Judine as we um, do communion. Good morning, everyone. If you have a to get your elements together, I give you that time right now while I read a few readings this morning. As and as my sister spoke about love, and my husband also spoke about love and marriage. How can I not read this from First Corinthians? 13.4, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, 
It always protects, it always trusts, and always hopes, always preserves. And from Ephesians 4, 1 through 8, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Oh. So in Matthew, it says, he took the cup, he gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant. Cup of joy. I know. Then he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, eat of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for forgiving me. Lord, I ask for forgiveness every day because I am not perfect. I thank you, Lord, for coming into my life and, and just holding, holding me up, Lord, because without you, I would be nowhere with nothing. So I thank you, Lord, for this covenant, and I thank you for your forgiveness and love. Amen. 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 We get to do this time and time again because we treasure this time. We treasure his gift. But I also realize that in this tradition, I've married this woman twice. Okay? Uh, we've renewed our vows. And we're going to continue to do that. How can we do any less for our Savior? To come together like this in communion to renew those vows, to celebrate his return. May we, may we all continue to do this. Amen. 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 Pray us out, or Steve? Stephen, can you pray us out? Oh, sure. Everyone, can we please bow our heads and close our eyes? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this day that you've created for us, Father. Father, we always thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom that pours out of your spirit, Lord, that pours into the vessels, Lord, that have given us things here, people here, and also just general going through and continuously learning and trying to edify and glorify your name, Father. We ask that you continue to bless, Lord, as we have taken the communion, knowing that it was your body, it was your blood that was shed and broken on Calvary, Father. You didn't have to do it, Father, and we just thank you and praise you that you did do it for us, Father, that we can live again. Lord, we're going to ask that you bless this day, and our pathways going forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.